really excited to jump right in. I want to do a little bit of um, reflecting um, as we as I get ready to introduce our morning speaker. And I want to just um, acknowledge, you know, we've had an interesting journey together and each of us has been on this journey. Um, oh my goodness, each of, each of the, us has been on this journey around health equity for quite some time and at varying places. So yesterday we spent a lot of time with Catherine first setting us up to talk about the what I call the imperatives so that we need to really be focused on centering our work in equity. It's not optional. It's really essential. And then we dove into um, getting into the nitty gritty. So the pre-work that we had, but we got a great chance to look at and thinking about the framework uh, for inter integrating equity into quality thinking about what the application looks like with a great example from Dr. Pena about what does it look like in a neonatal ICU? How do we think differently about which groups we are prioritizing and where are we introducing bias without perhaps being as aware as we could be? And that there's, um, there's a way that we can weave equity throughout our processes of quality improvement. Um, and then uh, Dr. Wyatt gave us a almost breathless introduction to the many ways that we should be thinking about this. And it was really, I think, helpful to both understand it in the framing of payment and why and what has been happening over time and how we might structure the collection of data, the kinds of interventions, the imperative to include community up front in these processes, the people who are gonna be most affected by, who we are trying to make improvements for um, and with. And, um, and I think that that was, so it, there was a lot of information and it was really nice to actually be able to reconnect in smaller groups this morning and to talk about the questions it left us with. And I think there's some, um, how do we actually apply this? What have we been learning in our own work? What have you been learning in the smaller groups that? Um, and in the work in your own organizations and what the challenges are um, and what some of the, uh, the opportunities are still for us. But what I want to do today is to pull back out. So not thinking so much about the specific examples of how we're improving um, quality and addressing and reducing and eliminating disparities, but thinking about some of the larger stances. What are, and I, I think, um, I'm reflecting yesterday when Dr. Pena was talking, she, she pointed out in one of her slides early on that you have to have a culture and an orientation and almost what I would call like tilling the soil, that your leadership needs to be invested in equity and the resources that it takes to do that and the long view. And, um, and I'll say that yeah, I think that all of us, uh, regardless of what we sit, where we sit in an organization and the direct work that we do, we're all leaders in our spheres. And we have an obligation to center equity in every part of our work. And, um, and to really not only think about how to support those who are doing the work, but how to foster that culture of equity um, that we learned about. And so I'm gonna, today we're gonna um, go ahead and I'm going to get, uh, I'm excited to really introduce you to someone who has been thinking about these issues on a different scale than we've been talking about. And that is Dr. Cameron Webb. Um, he is currently serves as a senior policy advisor, advisor for equity for the White House COVID-19 response team. And he's the director for health policy and equity at the University of Virginia School of Medicine. He's a practicing physician who spent much of his time in the last 20 months um, seeing COVID patients at the University of Virginia's Department of Medicine. Um, I will, I'm going to give you a 10 thing thing to consider as you, and you can think about this in our Q and A session. He was born with a superpower. It was inherited. So think about that and maybe you'll get a chance to ask him in our Q &A, Q and A. And during our time with Dr. Webb, you're gonna hear about national health equity priorities, get insights into strategies for advancing this at a scale different than we've been talking about. So not just one organization, but many organizations and across the nation. And then think about the action steps that you can take to advance racial health equity across our country. So it's my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Cameron Webb. And I'm gonna hand it off to you. Well, thank you so much. And it's, it's great to be with you all. Uh, it's this afternoon for me, but, uh, but it's great to be with you all. And, um, and 
actually, I have I have some slides I wanted to go through as we as we talk today. And so I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. Hopefully you can see, uh, you're gonna get a thumbs up if you can see my slides, okay. Um, let's see, awesome, awesome, okay. So, uh, and while I'm doing that, let me turn this window over. So, you know, I think it's, it's really, um, I love the theme, this construct of Stronger Together. So many of us have been in this space of thinking about and working toward equitable health, understanding what that really means and finding ways to, to execute to that end. And I, I think um, what I wanna do uh, for today's conversation uh, for, for the next little bit is just give you a sense of what this experience has been like uh, for me within the White House working on health equity work. You know, it's been really interesting because I, I said coming into this role that um, health equity work isn't a, a well-developed muscle in the federal government, so to speak. And so it was really uh, interesting to, to kind of lean into this experience and, and find our way forward. And I'm going to end with just a sense of where we are now and what it looks like to build more uh, and more equitable health system. Um, and so in some ways, this is a, a case study of COVID, but in other ways, it's, uh, it's talking about kind of how we ensure equitable health for all. I'll start with January of 2021, um, because that's really when, when things got kicked off for this administration in the uh, COVID-19 effort. And I, I always start by saying, what did we know at that point in time? Because, um, because it really informs how we approach the problems that we encountered. And in January of 2021, there were some equity trends that we saw uh, early on. We knew that the black death and case rates were disproportionately high. If you looked from you know, the, the spring of 2020 through the late fall of 2020. Uh, and so we, we saw that uh, at play. We saw that Hispanic shares of cases and deaths quickly exceeded their population share. Um, particularly with cases, we saw that um, among Native Americans, the cases remained disproportionately high uh, and death rates continued to grow. And then we saw that for white Americans, rates stayed disproportionately low through that first year. And so that was the, the context in which we were doing the work. You know, the other thing that we looked at is if you look at hospitalizations and on the left, you see black versus white hospitalizations per capita. And you see that in, in lots of parts of the country, we had twice the hospitalization rate in New Jersey and Massachusetts, 2.5 times in Minnesota, 2.3 times in Wisconsin. This was all over the country. And if you look for the Latino community, similarly, the hospitalization rates were significantly higher, three times higher in New Hampshire, 2.5 times higher in Rhode Island, three and a half times higher in Virginia. And so we knew that that was a big trend. And then if you look at deaths per 100,000 people by race and ethnicity, we also saw that those rates were much higher for communities of color. And so I think that that was really a, a big part of the, the context is that we had these data on outcomes for cases, for hospitalizations, for deaths, and we knew that there was disproportionality early on. And at the same time, when we talked about our vaccination effort, which really was the framework by which a lot of people talked about you know, instilling equity into the COVID response, we only had 52% of race and ethnicity data for vaccinations when we entered this administration. Think about that. One out of two vaccinations, we knew the race and ethnicity. How could we possibly ensure an equitable vaccination effort with so little data, with so much missing it. And there were three major uh, kind of data collection barriers versus that those data were inconsistently requested and collected at vaccine administration sites. The second is that individuals could opt out of answering those questions. And you think about the dynamics of trust uh, in, in different communities, particularly with the healthcare system, can understand why people would opt out of answering some of those questions. And then finally, there were provider and jurisdictional barriers. And one I'll point out in particular is state reporting restrictions uh, with concerns, uh, you know, specifically about um, data and how to submit those. And we had several states. Uh, and in fact, for a while, we lost the race and ethnicity data for vaccinations from California because there was, uh, from a statutory standpoint, there was a uh, requirement they not submit those data to CDC. And so we had to work uh, closely with the state to get those data back, right? But it just told us so much about, you know, the barriers that we were encountering. And when you see those three major factors, it should tell you that that 48% that's missing as of January of 2021, um, that was non-random missingness, right? We couldn't just take that and evenly distribute and impute across demographics. We knew that that missingness was driven by the same systemic and structural inequalities that were you know, creating barriers to, to access to vaccines and creating the challenges in vaccine confidence. And so that was the dynamic. And so you know, our initial response was to turn to the literature. You know, this is 
kind of um, the thought process is, well, what do we know? And, uh, and of course, the National Academy of Medicine, they came out with the framework for equitable allocation of COVID-19 vaccines in, in uh, late 2020. And so that was helpful to have that framework. And there are articles coming out from the New England Journal, from JAMA, from AJPH, and, and from Health Affairs, kind of the high impact factor journals, all talking about ensuring equity in, uh, in this response, particularly around the vaccination effort, um, but more broadly in the response in general. And we arrived at kind of the themes that we always arrive at when we talk about equity. And that's the social and economic factors drive health outcomes. You know, these six domains that we often talk about, economic stability, neighborhood and physical environment, education, food, community and social context, healthcare system. And then, of course, those cross-cutting impact of racism and discrimination, yeah, those, those are drivers of health outcomes in general. And it's no different. They're drivers of COVID inequity as well. And so you know, I, I, there's a really interesting paper uh, in 2020 that, that thought about those different outcomes that I talked about earlier on, the cases, hospitalizations, and deaths, and what was driving the disproportionality that we saw. And here are eight in particular that I wanted to highlight. And if you start with kind of who has high contact risk jobs, uh, then you think about who are those low wage frontline workers um, looking by race, ethnicity, and disproportionately, those are folks in communities of color. So in terms of that driver, high contact risk jobs, communities of color, harder hit. If you look at population density, the communities that are the most dense have higher proportions of people of color. If you look at food insecurity uh, by race and ethnicity, you see there are huge disparities there uh, for, for communities of color, black and, and Hispanic. And interestingly, this, is, this chart is through 2018. Food insecurity, as we know, got even worse during the pandemic you know, even, even more strained for a lot of reasons. If you look at public transport dependence, uh, so who's using public transit, the, the, there's a disproportionate share for communities of color in using transit, um, in using public transit. And so that was another, yet another driver. If you look at close housing quarters, this is looking at uh, the number of folks in the household. And, and even looking at five person or more households, you see there's a larger share, larger percentage in communities of color. And often you think about multi-generational housing and the impact there, which can be really significant, especially when you have differential exposures, but also differential risk for COVID outcomes. If you look at internet access, which is so key, especially in the vaccination effort, you know, we saw black and Hispanic adults are less likely than white adults to have a computer, to have home broadband. And we know that smartphone access is similar. Um, and so that's one area where um, we, we said, hey, maybe we can harness that reality to, to make some headway. It still didn't, you know, it's still not dispositive of the fact that we had these big gaps in access. That's the digital divide in so many ways. Comorbidities, I think a lot of folks are familiar with that, you know, who has asthma, who has diabetes, who has obesity, heart disease. You know, we do see a disproportionate burden there in communities of color. And then in terms of economic security, you know, who's uh, with incomes, that are below the poverty level, disproportionately communities of color have a higher rate. And so it was, it was tough because when you look at every single one of those drivers, you see how those in aggregate, how those all accrue to create this dynamic where communities of color are at greater risk. And again, when we're talking about uh, you know, equity and we're talking about COVID equity, you really have to start there. And so what's interesting is one of the first questions I asked, you know, again, digesting all this information was quite simply, how do we measure success? What does it even look like to be successful? And this is the kind of questions that we ask across health equity work, but it's true here as well. You know, I wanted to ask uh, my colleagues, the folks who, who asked me to join the White House team, I said, well, what, what does COVID-19 equity mean to you? When you say you're looking for somebody to lead this work, what does that actually mean? You know, and, and so definitionally, uh, we know that it, health equity is a state where everyone in the United States is able to achieve their goal health potential and that health potential is such an important concept there. And, and health equity is when everyone has that opportunity to be as healthy as possible. And within the context of COVID, we, you know, there were some great tools that came out, talked about what those principles are for achieving health equity. And that's collecting, analyzing, and reporting data that's disaggregated by race, ethnicity, gender, disability, neighborhood, and other socio-demographic characteristics. That's uh, the including uh, people in decision making, the nothing about us without us mentality, which is really important uh, in, in this kind of work. There's uh, establishing and empowering teams dedicated to promoting racial equity in response and recovery efforts. There's proactively identifying and addressing policy gaps uh, and advocating for further federal support, and then investing in strengthening public health, healthcare, and social infrastructure 
foster resilience. You have to terraform that environment to make it you know, more effective at closing gaps and ensuring equity. And so, you know, again, no presentation is complete without a confusing graph. And I think that, you know, when I talk about operationalizing COVID-19 equity, you have to have that framework to say, well, what are the root causes of that, uh, you know, of those challenges? And you see it's structural discrimination, it's racism, sexism, ableism, classism. And then you have all your policies uh, and processes that drive it. And ultimately, that's us needing to go far upstream of simply seeing the health outcomes and get back to the basics of how do we change the environment in which we're operating uh, and do that in short order in order to be effective. And so, you know, it's interesting because uh, in Dallas, uh, one thing they noticed very early on was that they needed, they had communities that were harder hit. Black and Hispanic residents were more likely to have uh, COVID, more likely to be hospitalized, more likely to die. And so the mayor said, well, can we, can we prioritize those same communities of color in COVID-19 vaccine distribution. This would be a familiar story to some of you. you know, of course, the county then said, yeah, we can do that. Let's shift access of the vaccine and we're going to target the most vulnerable neighborhoods. So it sounded like a good idea. This is January 19th, so just before the president was inaugurated. And then the next day, Dallas County canceled that plan to prioritize vaccination, uh, vaccine communities of color, after the state threatened to slash allocation. You see, I think in some ways, uh, what we were still stuck on is, is this fear that while we see the disproportionate harm, the disproportionate impact of COVID on communities of color, we know the need to really get those resources there. There are some people who were hung up on the idea of identifying race, of identifying that social vulnerability and prioritizing that, thinking that's in some way discriminating against other individuals, which became you know, a big challenge in the way that we're communicating to different communities. Hey, here's how you can prioritize the hardest hit, highest risk communities. And that's where this idea of disadvantage indices comes along. And it became really critical. So in, in broader health equity work, having those tools is so critical. So disadvantage indices, those help define priority groups or geographic areas, prioritize disadvantage groups um, by increasing the share of resources. And here we're talking about vaccines. You can tailor your outreach and communication. You can plan the location of interventions like vaccination sites. And I'll talk about how we incorporated this in our work. And also monitoring uptake resources. And some of the examples, I'll go through quickly, you know, social vulnerability index became the big one that folks were talking about in the CDC's uh, tool. And, and it, um, it uses census data. It ranks each county on 15 social factors across these four related themes, socioeconomic status, which includes poverty, unemployment, uh, income, high school education, household composition and disability is the second theme. Uh, and then minority status and language is the third. That's where we incorporate race into the SBI. And then housing type and transportation. And you look, you know, across the country, SBI gives a very different picture of where resources are most necessary. SBI wasn't created for COVID specifically. Uh, and, and, you know, kind of going back a slide, it was created uh, to address and, and direct resources in natural disasters or human caused disasters as well as disease outbreaks. So it has broad utility. Now there's the COVID-19 Community Vulnerability Index, which is similar. Uh, it has you know, six themes. So it has SES, household composition and disability, minority status and language and housing type and transportation, which should sound familiar from SVI, but it also incorporates epidemiologic factors and healthcare system factors to, to really help identify um, what that community level vulnerability really is not an individual's vulnerability, but that at that community level, what's the anticipated negative impact of COVID. And so that's where the, the CCBI became valuable. And of course, California is special. Um, Y'all always do your own thing. Uh, and, and, and I think we, we loved seeing uh, the incorporation of the Healthy Places Index. For me personally, because I've, I've worked uh, with some of my colleagues from Virginia Commonwealth University's Center on Society and Health for years, and so that was a really cool partnership with the Public Health Alliance of Southern California. But also it just speaks to how important it is for, for a state or for communities to know how to tell their story, to know how to capture the needs and concerns. So they had 25 different characteristics um, you know, put together in these eight categories. And it's familiar, right? Economic, education, housing, healthcare access, neighborhood, clean environment, transportation, and social factors. But interestingly, it's, it's how they weighted it, right? They looked the economic factors were nearly a third of the Healthy Places Index scores. You see uh, about one fifth was education. And then you have all the other factors as well. And allowed you to really capture what are those drivers 
of outcomes, and I think doing it in a very, uh, in a very consistent way. And, and the thing about disadvantaged indices, once we started talking about how they were an important part of the plan, you know, by the end of that first quarter of this year, so end of March, um, right before vaccines became available to all adults, you know, you had 34 states and three cities that had incorporated these indices into their vaccine allocation plans. And most states did use SVI because of its availability, because of its familiarity and use with CDC. But you know, we also saw foundations and community-based organizations using SVI-guided geomapping to target their outreach to complement the efforts uh, of the state. We saw states incorporating monitoring based on SVI into reopening frameworks. And we also saw that some public health officials uh, still face some of those charges of discrimination for using disadvantaged indices. But again, there's kind of the, the value of this being the mechanism across the country that so many people in places were, were trying to minimize uh, the inequities that we saw. So, you know, I think um, once you have a mechanism, once you have a way of measuring, once you have a way of naming and, and setting your target for health equity, it comes down to how do you devise a plan? And we, you know, of course, the, the president on day one released this national strategy for the COVID-19 response and pandemic preparedness. And, and I always say, even though I work at the White House, I still have such an activist and advocate mentality in my equity work. And so seeing that one of the goals, goal six, was all about protecting those most at risk, advancing equity, including across racial, ethnic, and rural urban lines, that was big. And that was really valuable. And there were you know, a total of seven key actions. So establishing a COVID equity task force, uh, increasing data collection and reporting, ensuring equitable access to critical resources like PPE tests, therapies, and vaccines, and then expanding access to high quality healthcare. Again, getting to the infrastructure, expanding the clinical and public health workforce, including community-based workers, you know, um, promotores de salud, making sure that we're getting folks into community, from community to help in this work, you know, strengthening the social service safety net to address unmet basic needs. And you can see in that confusing chart that I showed earlier, we're moving farther and farther upstream, uh, and then finally supporting those communities most at risk. And, and I start with the task force for a reason. The president issued an executive order on his second day in office establishing this task force with really a charge to do six things. I find out how to or recommend how to optimally allocate COVID resources, how to disperse relief funds in a way that advances equity to ensure effective culturally aligned messaging and outreach uh, to address ongoing health inequities faced by COVID-19 survivors, collect data, for the hardest hit communities and address longer term data shortfalls and challenges. So really you know, broad uh, set of, of goals and you know, the, the spoiler alert, I'll talk about it more later, but um, this task force after being established um, between you know, March and, and just last week uh, issued a total of over 300 interim recommendations on how to advance equity uh, in the COVID-19 response effort. You know, more broadly in the, in the national strategy, you know, I mentioned increasing data collection, and that was uh, expediting and streamlining data collection. We were at 52% of our, of our race ethnicity data for vaccinations. How do we get better? Uh, identifying those high-risk communities, track resource distribution, increase reporting of federal data, um, and expand data collection for commercially insured populations, so partnering with the plans. But really important was reaffirming privacy, because one of the big challenges we saw, uh, especially over the previous four years was that there was always a concern that in sharing these information, it can be used to do harm to certain communities. And so really reestablishing that sense of trust that hey, these, this, uh, the privacy element will still be maintained is really important. In terms of access to resources, we wanted to center equity in the response with regard to access to PPE and tests and therapies and vaccines. And we wanted to get states to update their state pandemic plans to make sure they were talking about equity. And in fact, you know, since the beginning of this year, every other week, I meet with the state COVID-19 equity leads from all the different states. And the reason that we do that is we want states really centering that. And some have been absolute leaders and others have been using that space to learn from each other and find out what they can incorporate and bring into their own states or territories. Uh, you know, we strengthen enforcement of anti-discrimination requirements. We have this large kind of targeted stakeholder data-informed vaccination communication campaign. That's the We Can Do This campaign. And so a lot of our time is spent on advising and guiding We Can Do This to make sure that it's incorporating 
best practices from an equity standpoint, and then prioritizing diverse and inclusive representation in clinical research. That continues to be critical, uh, and especially as we've talked about the vaccine. You heard this, you know, if you were following the ACIP uh, conversation yesterday, you heard people talk about, you know, the representativeness of the, uh, of the studies and how that's a big part of parents and kids feeling safe and comfortable. Um, and then you have expanding access to high quality health care. So we wanted more funding to community health centers. We knew that was going to be really an engine and a driver uh, for health and well-being in these communities, uh, greater assistance to safety net institutions, supporting HCBS or home and community-based services, which is critical for the disability community, and also uh, you know, supporting care and research on long COVID. And because we knew the disproportionate burden of COVID cases also meant disproportionate burden of long COVID in, in certain communities. And so preparing for those inequities born from the early disparities or inequities in, uh, in cases. And then really critical is expanding mental health services. This pandemic exposed so many of the mental health challenges and we wanted that to be front and center in our work. And on the workforce piece, uh, getting more federal assist, uh, officials to under-resourced areas, creating a public health workforce program of new community-based workers to assist in testing, tracing, and vaccination. And of course, we rolled that out in May. Um, and then, you know, in terms of the social service safety net, more, you know, having federal agency COVID-19 health equity leads. So that's at USDA, at Department of Ed, and really across government, making sure we've got folks who are thinking about and considering this uh, in all the different agencies, but also um, extending flexibility. So that was the, you know, eviction moratorium and things along those lines, and, and then linking clinical and social services, which is a big goal, but always critical for us to do. And then finally, the supporting the communities most at risk. And we, we kind of frame that as older adults, refugees, adults with chronic medical conditions, rural communities, uh, you know, congregate settings and, and, and thinking, yes, a lot of folks think about long-term care, um, but also thinking about homeless shelters and correctional and detention facilities uh, and you know, nursing homes more broadly, re refugee communities, group homes, where a lot of younger advocates were saying, this is a congregate setting too, and we need those resources. So just really getting out front of that. And, and I think that that's when we just said, hey, if we have this plan, and if we have an approach across those, you know, those seven different, you know, areas where we're focusing for this goal of equity, then we can get the job done. And so we, we jumped right in. So we said, how do we prioritize equity? Well, we created these mass vaccination centers, so community vaccination centers. And actually, California was the state that had the very first uh, two in L.A. and in, in the Bay. And it was uh, interesting because we prioritized it first off the size of the state, but also by social vulnerability index score. And ultimately, we launched 36 of these CVCs in high-risk areas with almost 60% of the doses given to people of color. And in some states, uh, you know, some of the sites use uh, what we call the hub and spoke model, where they would have the, the CVC, the mass vaccination site, and then they would have mobile units out in community that reach even more people as a way to extend the impact. You know, and that, that was a picture of me at the, the Greensboro, North Carolina um, CBC when they opened. You know, we had the federal retail pharmacy program, 21 retail pharmacy partners. This has been the biggest engine for our vaccination effort. But since the beginning, we always focused those retail pharmacy partners on placing or selecting their pharmacies based on SVI, driving more of the pharmacies that are vaccinating to communities that had higher social vulnerability index scores. And that's why we were able to see a large percentage. And, you know, as we've moved on, you know, nearly half of the folks in recent months have been, who've been vaccinated through the program are from uh, communities of color, which is, which is good to see. If you look at other programs, we have our, our community health center program or FQHCs, and there are about 1,400 in the country. All of them were invited to participate in, and nearly 900 um, were receiving doses directly, became that go-to place in their own community to be able to get vaccinated. Three-fourths of the doses administered from CVs, from uh, community health centers, went to people of color. You know, the, the dialysis clinics, you know, direct allocations to dialysis clinics, that wasn't originally in the, in the plan, but we saw pretty early on that, that mortality rates uh, for folks with end-stage renal disease were about 50% and disproportionately. 34% of people with end-stage renal disease are, are Black, 19% are Latino, and we said this is disproportionately harming the segment of the community, and these folks have regular access to the healthcare system, right? They're not able to, to shelter in place, so they're at increased risk because at least, you know, several times a week, they're going into healthcare spaces. 
then that's putting them in harm in harm's way. So, so we said, hey, what else can we do? We can get doses directly to large dialysis organizations like Davina and Fresenius. And, and ultimately, they went to over 2,000 different sites across the country. Dialysis clinics received uh, vaccines directly because we were focused on doing this from an, from an equity standpoint. And, and I think, you know, ultimately money matters. So making sure we're getting dollars in different places. We talk about building that infrastructure, you know, $6 billion in the American Rescue Plan funding with community health centers, over 300 million uh, to jurisdictions for community health workers, specifically 100 million for the increased vaccine access for older Americans and, and folks with disabilities. On the vaccine confidence front, we had 3 billion in grants to the states, uh, again, to promote work with community-based organizations and faith-based organizations to, to advance vaccination equity. A quarter billion dollars in grants through the Office of Minority Health, again, going to community and faith-based organizations. We, we just knew that CBOs and faith-based organizations would be the backbone of a thoughtful response that's rooted in community because of the trust dynamic, because of their reach and their connection. If we can really drive good information there, make a difference. And really quickly, what I'll also add is the Surgeon General launched the Community Corps, um, which was huge because it gave us another mechanism to get really good, accurate, thoughtful information to these same entities. And we have over 14,000 folks in the Community Corps across the country, which is pretty exciting. We did a, the Shots of the Shop initiative, right? Barbershops and beauty salons, uh, over a thousand registered to participate in the vaccination effort by you know, getting vaccine education information out there or even holding vaccination events, which was pretty cool. You know, over two billion uh, again in in, uh, in funding that went specifically to advancing health equity, uh, communities of color, and rural areas, and then also another 150 million to get more access to monoclonal antibodies. So again, the resources, those therapeutics, making sure those are being distributed equitably. And we didn't do this just um, you know with our best ideas, our best thoughts. We worked with, like I said, faith-based organizations. With, civil rights organizations, workers' unions, uh, historically black colleges and universities or Hispanic-serving institutions, we have trusted media outlets, nonprofits, advocacy groups, research institutes, provider associations, just constantly and consistently engaging uh, across these stakeholder groups to make sure we knew what needed to be done. And at one point we realized that we had uh, lower rates of vaccination in, in certain states. And we actually partnered with the National Medical Association. We said, find us, you know, doctors, black doctors in these states that have lower vaccination rates, we gave them the media markets we needed. They found us doctors and, you know, from a media training standpoint, got them ready to go on TV and radio. And, and we had ultimately 425 million broadcasts and online impressions from this group of, of providers in communities that, that we saw lower vaccination rates. And this happened over the summer. And in these same communities, we saw vaccination rates really jump up in July and August, in part because of the Delta surge, but also because they were hearing from people who are from their community, are in their community, are committed to their community, right? Not just talking heads or, or politicians saying, go get vaccinated, but your local doctor, somebody that you know, or your local nurse. And, and I think that made a huge difference. And, and so, you know, we, we got out on the road. This is you know, uh, Raleigh, North Carolina, this is the second gentleman and I in Chicago, the first lady and I in Savannah, Georgia. We, we really did a ton of outreach going into community. And we heard very early on that in, in places, and I mentioned Chicago, uh, a gentleman mentioned to us at a barbershop that you know, he was glad to see the White House taking this interest in getting information about COVID out there. And he's like, you know, it's certainly scary. It's certainly a problem. Like, but I, I'll be honest, I don't know anybody who's died from COVID in the last month, but I know 12 young people who died from gun violence in our community in the last month. You know, And I think that, that was, it was such a powerful moment for a lot of people because we said we, we can't enter communities to just talk COVID, COVID, COVID. You know, COVID happens in community context. That's what equity work is about. So putting this pandemic and in this virus in its proper context. And, and we found, uh, went down to Columbus, Georgia, and found that, you know, they had a similar problem with an increase in youth violence, but it was because when COVID shut down so much of their community, the normal outlets that young people used to stay out of trouble <laughs> were not available to them. And so suddenly they're sitting here thinking, well, you know, what do I do? And it just, you know, it, it kind of pulled the rug from under them in terms of the infrastructure to promote more community harmony. And I think that's where we say, well, how can we address those kind of challenges? Because that's a COVID conversation. And that's, that's the way that we shifted 
our focus. And, you know, we actually convened all the, the living uh, former surgeons general. Uh, interestingly, they're all uh, physicians of color. Um, every one of the living former surgeons general. And this is from Republican to Democratic administrations, very different in terms of political ideology. Every one of them advocating for vaccination. Every one of them saying these vaccines are safe and they're effective and we should use them. The, the tall person that I'm sitting next to in that picture is a basketball player for the Phoenix Suns, JaVale McGee. And, and he talked about his vaccination journey and why he got vaccinated. And it was, it was so interesting talking to him, again, leveraging you know, the, some of the, the folks who have a big platform, but he wasn't out there proselytizing. He was just like, well, I have asthma. And he was like, I have to travel a lot for work. Go figure. He's a pro basketball player. He's like, I've got to travel a lot for work. I have asthma. I have a two-year-old daughter who can't be vaccinated yet. And so it just made sense. And he was like, you know, the thing that we have, we have a lot of doctors who are connected to our team who talk to us about this. And it just made a lot of sense for me to get vaccinated. And just telling that story of why he made that decision in a very logical way. It wasn't that he was being herded or, or you know, he's just following the masses. It was, it was him protecting himself, his family, and in his livelihood. He said, you know, if I get sick with COVID, I miss weeks of games. It hurts my team. It hurts our ability to compete. And so I didn't want to do that. And I think those are the kind of things that, that really help. And, you know, I mentioned some of these trips and, and that community context piece in Columbia, South Carolina. We talked about affordable housing, which is the, the challenge in that community. We brought Secretary Fudge from Housing and Urban Development, and we, we literally talked about how the city's affordable housing crisis was exacerbated by COVID. In Jacksonville, we talked about food access, food insecurity, and, 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 and the impact that had, and, and they talked about how important it was uh, to connect uh, that issue with the COVID dynamic. They talked about supply chain challenges, how that exacerbated issues, how they didn't have folks at, at a lot of the... Um, the, the food pantries who normally help support, they weren't able to do that support work because of COVID and that really impacted their ability uh, to, to help serve those families. Uh, I mentioned Columbus, Georgia, where we had youth, uh, we talked about youth violence and, and we had the director of the Office of Victims of Crime from the Department of Justice come with us and, and be a part of that conversation. Um, it is so interesting because we had violence interrupters and law enforcement officials and community leaders and they looked around at one point in the conversation, they said, we're never all in the same room at the same time. We never do this. This is great. And they were like, and then to have somebody who has access to the grants, who knows what kind of resources are available for us, this is powerful. And again, that's a COVID equity conversation. And in Mobile, Alabama, it was about mental health. That was the focus. And that's what we were able to, to really advance. And I mentioned the barbershops and beauty salons and that continued to be uh, a big theme is, is visiting those unique spaces for truth telling in certain communities and, and talk about how all spaces can be spaces for public health. We brought a team from the Department of Education with us and we had conversations with parents and with students uh, to talk through not just the vaccines, but the impact of COVID on schools and that experience and how we can keep schools safely open. You know, and I think that when you put all that together, that, you know, that's just some of, of the work that went into designing a paradigm. Uh, in this pandemic response geared toward equity, you know, we, we said we felt like we had a, a good start and it gave us a chance to be effective. And so you ask the question, well, how's it going, right? You know, are we making any progress? <laughs> and, and so these are data that I just pulled uh, today for you, but this is weekly cases by race and ethnicity. And you see, we, we had that spike back in, in January, which is the big spike in the middle of the chart. And then the, the second spike is, of course, the Delta spike. And the the American Indian Alaska Native community saw the highest number of cases you know, per capita, um, but we've seen other groups, those really narrow. And, and just to zoom into the last couple of weeks, you can see that, you know, you've got these, you know, different groups here uh, for Black, Hispanic, and white all around the same place in terms of, of cases per capita and, and all decreasing, which is really critical, right? We want to see those numbers go down. And I just remind folks, you know, we're still seeing nearly 70,000 cases per day if you look at the average of the past week. And so when we were back in June, we were thinking this is coming to an end and before Delta really took hold, um, you know, we were only seeing about 10,000 cases per day. So that, you know, we still have a lot of virus and that's why I'd still have to keep our, our foot on the gas in terms of protecting communities, but we are making progress. And, and this is looking at cases by social vulnerability index. 
And, um, and whereas initially blue line is high SBI, there are higher cases there. Uh, we saw that kind of flip flop over the last few months in part because a lot of the resources going to those communities, um, you know, and then if you look at emergency department visits, again, this is us having data that's available, that's accessible, that tells us what's going on, disaggregated by race and ethnicity. And, and I, I will stop and, and give a plug uh, because this isn't good enough, right? This is disaggregated by race and ethnicity. But if you look, you see the light blue line is, is Asian Pacific Islander. And in California, that's not good enough as a, as a demographic grouping, right? We need, to, we need to be able to break that down. This is all built on an, an OMB uh, standard created in 1997. And then we talk about how we can update that. There were conversations around updating that standard in 2016, and it lost its momentum. Uh, but, you know, again, reinvigorating those conversations so states can have actionable information. It's disaggregated, it allows, allows them to identify the communities they need to be focusing in on and supporting. And I think that that's so helpful, you know, and I think this, this kind of speaks to that uh, to some extent. If you look at hospitalizations, you know, we've seen the number of hospitalizations come down. Um, this is over the past you know, year and a half. But, we're, you know, the job's certainly not done. We still see in certain communities, this is American Indian, Alaska Native, those numbers are still peaking. And, and this is where I make that case that the resources needed, the Indian Health Service, you know, the American Rescue Plan put a lot of dollars into IHS, but we need to continue to support IHS. We need more and more funds and resources going. If you ask, well, where are the areas where we're seeing the cases and the hospitalizations? California is one of them. Arizona is one. New Mexico, you know, we're seeing in those areas, uh, you know, real peaks in cases and hospitalizations or spikes, I should say, uh, in in uh, in Native communities. And there's just a lot of work left to do. But they need the resources to to make sure they're able to support. And this is looking kind of zooming into the last few weeks, and you see those numbers are coming down. And then we were glad to see for, for Black, non Hispanic, it came down um, significantly. Again, that's a lot of the vaccination effort, it's a lot of the uptick in vaccines that we see. Uh, and then this is looking at deaths, deaths are way down um, by race and ethnicity. If you look at uh, most communities, it, it's, it's significantly down from where we were, you know, for instance, in April of last year because the vaccines are effective and the most at-risk individuals have been vaccinated. And this is zooming in on deaths as well. And then finally deaths by SBI, or this is actually by rural and urban status. And I showed you a slide earlier on about data. And I said 52% uh, was what we had in terms of the race of this data for vaccinations. But look at this map now. And this is just a testament uh, over the last couple of weeks. This is where we are. See how, how much dark blue we're seeing now in terms of states reporting at higher levels. This is creating and building an infrastructure to continue to collect information that matters. And at this point, we're in most weeks, we're at around 80% of uh, 75 to 80% of the vaccinations. We have you know, race ethnicity data. Um, it took us a long time, but we got Texas's data in. We were really excited about that, right? You were able to get a glimpse into who's getting the resources they need. And in some instances, I'll, I'll say this isn't all because the federal government was was pushing and CDC was calling. It's because states were talking to their peer states. They already realized there's no success in this pandemic without equity. And so, you know, the folks in, in you know, South Carolina would call the folks in North Carolina. They, they say, how did you do it? How are you doing um, doing it? And North Carolina said, well, we required reporting that information. And that's how we got to 97, 98 percent. And they're like, OK, interesting. And they're learning from each other. So creating those learning environments is so important. Um, and then, you know, of course, for vaccination uh, status, you know, there are a lot of different ways to look at what equity is. I think in terms of our data completeness, because overall, we had so much missing this early on, we still only have a little less than two thirds of the data in aggregate, because a lot of these were done in January, February, and March. Um, but and so with that missingness, it's hard to say exactly what vaccination rates are by race ethnicity, but we can see the vaccination share for each demographic. And that's what this chart depicts. And, um, and you can see, you know, for, for non-Hispanic white, um, the green bar is the last two weeks. And you see that um, the, the rate is lower. But overall, if you look at non-Hispanic black and for Hispanic, the green bars the last few weeks are higher and where they were, where they are overall, which tells you it's getting more equitable. We're getting better distribution, more equitable uh, distribution. And um, and I like to you know break it down into the different phases of 
of the pandemic. And you know, we saw this is the percent of the population for each of these races and ethnicities. And overall, 17.3% of, uh, of vaccines have gone to the Hispanic community. Um, you know, we're at 10.6% for the black community and 60.2% for the, for the white community. If you look at adults, since all adults became eligible in April, so one of the things we saw was that it was confusing to people when you're like, you may be eligible in this state, but not in that state. And you have to be this age with this medical condition. We just said all adults are eligible to be vaccinated. Look at how the numbers change. The Hispanic community, nearly a quarter of the vaccines from the Hispanic community since we kind of really got clear, streamlined information out there. And the Black community, it's nearly at their population share. This is during our month of action where we had really dedicated target work where I was on that bus tour, 30% of those vaccines went to the Latino community, you know, and so we saw much higher rates. And then if you look at the Delta search, which is, you know, post July 1st, you see this uptick among non-Hispanic white individuals and among black individuals. And that's in a lot of rural communities. What we saw is that seeing loved ones get COVID, get hospitalized, get sick, really motivated a lot of people to get vaccinated. You know, it kind of took the wind out of the sails of this whole, it's a, it's a myth, it's not real. And we saw that, you know, from a lot of, and I think this allows us to take a look at, you know, there are a lot of different motivations for people at different times. Sometimes it was access. Sometimes it was, you know, the, the way that we were sharing information. Sometimes it was the dedicated effort. Sometimes it was the disease and, and the virus and how it's spreading. But no matter what, there were different drivers that helped us make progress. I mean, this is the vaccination rate by race and ethnicity. Um, I hate these data because, again, High level of missingness, it's only 67% of the data. So it makes you think that only 38.4% of Black folks are vaccinated and 44% of white individuals, 45% of Hispanic Latino. And, and that doesn't quite make sense, right? If we looked at it, 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 it it's because of the missingness. And if we looked at it, we're at 66.5% of the population overall has had uh, you know, at least one dose. And, 57% is fully vaccinated, and there's no demographic that matches that. So how does that make sense? It's those same three factors that I showed you all earlier, those drivers of the missingness and its non-random nature. And so it makes it hard to interpret this. So we combine this with, uh, with survey data. Again, because to do health equity work, you know, you can't treat what you, what you can't see. And so it's so important to have data that's actionable. And this is the CDC's National Immunization Survey. They do it every week, and, and the most recent one we have showed that 77.6% of white non-Hispanic individuals are vaccinated, and 77% of black non-Hispanic, 79.6% of Hispanic Latino. This is a survey of nearly 16,000 individuals. It really closely approximates the overall vaccinated population, so 78.3 is pretty close to where we are nationally. It's a phone-based survey, which helps because it's not just online, which you know, reflect some of the digital divide piece. But the thing is, we combine this, we look at this and say, okay, that's one picture. This is among adults, to be clear. But then Kaiser Family Foundation has their vaccine monitor that we've all been following since the beginning of the vaccination effort. And it sees 73% of Black adults, 72% of white adults, 70% of Hispanic adults. And when I tell you that back in May, the gap was about 10% between Black and white vaccination rate, you know, we've seen a lot that's happened since then that's allowed us to narrow these gaps, and then you see rural residents still down at 58%, you know, definitely not, still at 33%, one third of rural residents. So there's still work left to do. But if you track it over time, this is what I meant by those gaps earlier on. If you track it over time, you see that it made a lot of progress, it made a lot of progress, but if the job's not done. Uh, you know, of course, the most recent data we're seeing among pregnant people is that there are still big gaps. Overall, 34% of pregnant people are vaccinated, but 18% of Black pregnant people and 29% of Latino pregnant people, 36% of white pregnant people. So we still have to identify populations, groups, and, and find our way. I'm going to bring it to a close. Who knew I could do 82 slides in just a 45-minute stretch? Um, it's because I talk fast. Um, but I, I think that, uh, you know, when we say what's next, what do we do? This is, you know, the the president's COVID-19 action plan that he put out in September helps us fight our way. And it, it continues to focus on vaccinating the unvaccinated, right? We're not letting up on getting uh, every, everybody who's eligible vaccinated. And as of last night, we got 
five to 11 year olds eligible. And so that's, that's going to be 28 million more people. And this is a demographic that, you know, this is that browning of America demographic, right? More children of color uh, in, in this age bracket because they're, you know, communities of color are more represented in younger age demographics. This further protecting the vaccine, that's the boosters conversation and making sure that that's getting out, that information is getting all communities, keeping schools safely open. And we know how critical that is, both, you know, from a socio-emotional standpoint for a lot of young folks, but also for our economy. And so that's huge. Um, increasing testing and requiring masking, so making tests more accessible, which we know is going to be a key to, to you know, ending this pandemic, and protecting the economic recovery, and then finally improving care for folks with COVID-19, so the therapeutics. And, and so, you know, for all of those things, we've been executing. And, and so, you know, on, on uh, vaccine, we had the vaccine requirements um, that, uh, that we put out, and so We've seen that that's been really effective at getting more and more people vaccinated every day. Uh, it's funny because the mythology is that, uh, oh, everybody's going to quit their job uh, because you asked them to be vaccinated. The fact and the truth is that no people get vaccinated. You know, when you have these kind of requirements for kids in schools, they don't, you know, skip out on school. They don't go to private schools where they don't have to be vaccinated. No, they get vaccinated because it's a public health priority and it, and it works. Requirements work. Now, if you look at, you know, the boosters, of course, the president got his. I got my booster a couple of weeks back and I happened to get my flu shot on the same day. I do not recommend that. I see Christina shaking her head. She was like, why would you do, why would you do that? Yes, Christina, I know, I know. Um, but, but you know, I think getting a booster was so helpful because I still work this weekend. I'm working on the COVID unit and I have that sense that, hey, I'm, I'm still protected. I got my second shot in January. So it was good to make sure I'm still protected um, and, and that matters for my kids, for my family, for my community. You know, in terms of, of the testing piece, we spent two billion initially on buying rapid at home tests, and then an additional one billion. And the reason and this was an interesting point, but we found that the manufacturers themselves they weren't making as many tests because they were like, well, in June we thought this pandemic was coming to a close. We're not going to make millions of tests if nobody's going to be buying them. So the federal government just procured them. We bought these, you know, 200 million plus, 280 million tests. And we were just like, you don't have to worry about the market for it, right? We're gonna buy these tests, just get them out there, make sure people have access to these tests. And that's been really helpful. People don't have to, you know, hoard them, go to CVS and buy all the Binax Now tests anymore. You can, you know, you, you can expect that they're gonna be more readily available. You know, I mentioned the task force and, and I will say they issued their final report on um, uh, just the other day, just last week on the 28th. And, and so uh, they issued their recommendations. This was a, a really amazing group and, and they named five priority areas they wanted us to focus on. So kind of ending the conversation today with just a, a talk, of, you know, a look at, at priorities. And, and they talked about empowering and investing in community-led solutions, uh, enforcing a data ecosystem that promotes equity-driven decision-making, increasing accountability for health equity outcomes, investing in a representative healthcare workforce. And I wanna say that louder for the folks in the back, right? Investing in a representative healthcare workforce is so big uh, to help increase equitable access to everyone. And then they actually recommended um, building and creating a permanent health equity infrastructure in the White House. And so we're taking these recommendations, they're actually gonna you know, formally you know, submit this report in the coming days. And there were so many interesting recommendations. I mentioned there were over 300 interim recommendations, but 55 recommendations are kind of their refined priority recommendations that they're sending our way. And we have been able to take a look at those. Um, again, coming from subject matter experts, stakeholders, members of the public. And, and there are things like recognizing healthcare as a human right, supporting long coverage insurance, long COVID insurance coverage, or you know collecting best practices on culturally and linguistically responsive contact tracing, right? Really granular ideas on how we can be better at making sure that everyone has equitable access to high quality care. That's one of their areas. On the data front, you know, standardizing demographic information, um, tracking and reporting outcomes, uh, even talk about funding data modernization. It's something the CDC is working on now to make sure that their goal of data accurately representing our populations and their experiences to drive equitable decisions. On structural drivers and xenophobia, um, they, they're focusing on you know, health equity centered in all practices, processes, and policies. Uh, and, and so 
Yes, broadband access, affordable housing, healthy food options, right? These are part of what the COVID equity task force is advocating for. And then on the community, on the communication front, um, you know, making sure that we're uh, creating a, a pandemic response authority and executing long COVID communication or doing the COVID after action report, funding organizations that work for community of color. All right. So th these are these are this is what equity work ultimately comes down to having real action-oriented recommendations and creating accountability around it. And so our job at this point is, you know, they're going to submit this report to us in the coming days. And then we have to turn around and tell the American people how we're going to take this, uh, this advice and use it to work toward that really goal, that really big goal of health equity. It's not, a, it's not an aspiration. You know, it can't be. And we've learned that through this pandemic. It has to be mission critical. And I think that's something that that's possible. And it's something that's only possible with great partners, great community leaders like yourselves. And so with that, like I said, 81 slides in like 45 minutes, I deserve a cookie. I'm going to pass it back and, and looking forward to taking any questions. Wow. Well, I'm going to take the prerogative um, to, to start us off and then give chance for people to put their questions together. And we've got ample time, about 30 minutes at least. Um, for all of you to ask questions. I, I'm, I'm a little breathless because that was a whirlwind and it was a whirlwind on a couple of different levels that I think are pretty remarkable. So one, obviously this is a pandemic. It's unlike what any one of us have seen in our lifetime. What I'm really struck by though um, is that so much of what we talked about yesterday was a framework for equity. And, to, and, and this is the meta example of applying every single one of those things. You started with data to figure out where to focus. You went to multiple different strategies. You involved communities in the process. And so it's, it's, a, it's an amazing uh, bookend, actually, to, the, to, to our two days in many, many ways. My questions for you are a couple, and then I'll, I'll open it up. Um, when you think about the infrastructure that you had to build to make this happen. What, um, and the immediate thought I had is, you know, the pandemic will at some point ease. What is this part of the infrastructure that we need? What is, what's your perspective, having seen this through, having seen the implementation towards action, what is it that we can um, keep and sustain? And I think your last slides started to get at this for our chronic conditions. Mm -hmm. We're not always going to have a pandemic. Yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm a recovering politician. And what I'll tell you is that, um, you know, those stories that you hear from people really stick with you. And there was a, a woman I met at a church in Georgia during the pandemic who said, you know, it's really, it was really striking to her how many people had showed up at her door saying, get COVID vaccine, get vaccinated, COVID, COVID, COVID. And, and she was like, people care so much about us getting vaccinated against this virus but nobody ever shows up at my door about my blood pressure or my diabetes or my cancer or my mental health. No, like these issues have been killing more people every year <laughs> than COVID in our communities in aggregate, but nobody's showing up caring about us. So, so to your question, I think it's a few things. I, you know, I, I've already spoken to the data infrastructure. I think that's critical, right? You can't, you can't treat what you can't see. And so it's so important to know what the dynamics are, but I think the public health workforce infrastructure is so key. And our investment in in you know community health workers again from community in community leading the work I think is going to be really a key. We we saw through this pandemic that our public health infrastructure was woefully inadequate, woefully underfunded, and I think that um, the same way that and I think the president has, has constantly used this framing of you know almost this is a wartime effort as, as he describes it right. And I think if you think of it that way. We don't, we don't, you know, remove our investment in our military just because we're not actively in war. We don't, you know, what we, we keep that at a, in a place where we're ready for anything that can come our way. We're ready to mobilize. And I think that's something that we've learned. And it's not always going to be an infectious disease pandemic. Um, you know, we want to be able to point that attention and, you know, to, to other key conditions. And, and the president, when he was the vice president a couple of years back, he was leading the cancer moonshot, right? And it's just like, well, how do we take some of those same concepts 
you know, there was the 21st Century Cures Act that, that he was, played a big part in, right? Is so how do we take some of those principles and say, we want to invest in a robust way. We want to involve public health. We want to have uh, real data that we can look at and know what's going on in the community. I think those are some of the, the you know, key essentials. Um, and then I think the accountability piece, because ultimately, you know, what we, what we learned was we are at our best from a federal perspective, we're learning from the states, we're learning from communities. And at the same time, when we're being transparent and saying, here's what we're doing, and we're getting feedback in real time on how we can do it better. Because even though I'm proud of a lot of the work we've done on equity, I, every single day, I'm looking for people to give us feedback on what we can do better, because that's, that's what equity work looks like. There's no perfect. It's just continuing to iterate until you get it more right, you know? Uh, and so I think that those are some of the keys. Fantastic, thank you. Um, when you think about the accountability piece, and now let's crosswalk from this pandemic and, and this huge effort here to thinking about sustainability, how do we, what's your thought, given the vantage point that you've had on getting to accountability that we all share rather than the siloed version that we currently have where it's state-based or it's insurance-based? What are some thoughts that you have for us around accountability for equity? Yeah, that's that's a that's a tough one because I think that it's built on an inequitable healthcare system, you know, to start. And so I think it, it starts there. You have to say, how do we make sure that everybody has true access to care? And that idea of universal health access, that means different things to different people. But we should simplify it just that no matter who you are, no matter where you are, you can get the care that you need when you need it. And it's not gonna, you're not gonna break the bank doing doing so. And I think that, that in those terms, that's something that there's widespread support around. Our politics get in the way sometimes of how we get to execute on that. But I think that that's a that's a starting point for our ability to, to achieve some accountability. You know, I'm, I'm be a broken record and say the data and that transparency and data is so key. And um, and I'll say it, you know, as an advocate, as an activist. I have my moments of frustration with CDC where I'm just like, hey, release more data. Like we want to see this, we wanna see that. Um, and even if you don't like the way that it looks, I don't care, put it out there because it is the truth. It's what people need to see and it's gonna help us get what we need to, to move this in the right direction. And what I've learned is that CDC, it's not that they're kind of hoarding the data and scared to show that they have a really high data quality standard to, to put something out and say, this is what is happening in the country, uh, according to the CDC, when we have, you know, 61% of race ethnicity data on vaccinations. So if they were to put out, well, here's exactly where it is. They're like, well, we can't say with our highest level of certainty, this is where it is. So I think that, that you know, my, my fix there is I'm like, well, help, help me get those numbers higher so you can put out that information, right? And, and that's kind of where we found some, some common ground. And I think that's going to continue to be really important. But that you know, that data collection and reporting, that transparency creates accountability, you know, and I think that's so, that's so valuable to us. So I think that, um, you know, Marcella Nunez-Smith, and I, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention uh, Dr. Nunez-Smith, she leads the COVID Health Equity Task Force, and she's uh, one of my, my dear colleagues here in the White House. And, you know, we talk about it often that, you know, in the vaccination effort, um, people talk so much about confidence and, safety and efficacy. And we were like, none of that matters without access. <laughs> like if you don't have a place to get a shot, then who cares if we convinced you that the vaccine is safe and effective, you don't want to get it, right? And the same is true with healthcare more broadly. And access is not just insurance. Uh, you know, it's, it's the approachability, the availability, the acceptability. Um, you know, th those are the affordability, of course. Um, and I think those are all dynamics that, that I think we need to pay really close attention to as we move forward so that we can move toward a more, equi more equitable outcome in health in the United States. I'm gonna ask you one last one and then I'll open it up for others. Can you speak to that distilled list of priorities that you got at the end? What's one thing that, um, that didn't make it on the list mm. that, you wish had, it was either contentious for some reason, or there just wasn't the, the kind of the strength of the evidence or, um, or you had to just make a cutoff. What's one thing that you wish you would have seen on there? Yeah, that, that's, a, that's an awesome question. And unfortunately I'm not the right person for that question because 
uh, the, the nature of the kind of task force that, that it is. Um, as a White House member, I'm not allowed to sit on the task force. So I get their report, but I'm not in their deliberations. And, but you know, I've been able to participate in their public facing meetings. And I think by the time they got down to the recommendations, there was a lot of unity from the task force on them. But I, I you know, there are some that weren't on the list that I shared. Um, but I imagine, I think some that even made the list were contentious, you know, even that concept of ensuring health care as a human right. Um, that's something that a lot of people say. And I think, sadly, a lot of people in politics, you know, will, will claim that and say, yeah, health care is a human right with no teeth behind it. They're not actually operationalizing it. But there was a specific one of the recommendations was about lowering the Medicare age. Right. And so that, as I always tell folks, uh, we want the like task forces or federal advisory committees to to be ambitious, to be to to think big and to to push us because that's what's going to move us as far as we can go. I think we also say we may not be able to do all of these uh, to the full extent, but by all means, if you think it's part of our path to equity, put it out there. Make sure that there's a public awareness that hey, this is part of the plan. And if for whatever reason we're not able to do it now. It doesn't mean that it falls off forever. So, so I mean, I'm sure I, now that's a question I want to ask the task. Force. I, want to, I want to say, what, what didn't make the list, right? Because I think that um, there are phases to this work, and even if things made it on this list, um, there, there are there. This is creating the foundation or the new foundation for the future lists uh, to help us get to to more equitable healthcare in the United States, and I think that's really important. Fantastic. Well, thank you. That's a great note for me to hand off to Rebecca Hargraves, who's going to open us up and facilitate getting questions to you. Great. Thank you, Dr. Mutha. Thank you, Dr. Webb. Um, I'm going to open it up to our group of CIM partners. Uh, I'd just like to ask when I call on you to please introduce yourself uh, to help Dr. Webb get a sense of who you are and where you're from. Um, and if you haven't had a chance to put in a question yet, or you'd like to speak, uh, please just, just denote that in the chat box. We've got some time. So first up is Sophie. Hi, thank you so much. Amazing presentation. I'm Sophie Baker, president of Center for Care Innovations. Um, as you mentioned, there's a lot of things that we can learn um, from these concentrated efforts to improve health equity. And there's many things that can then be applied for other areas where we need to do more work on around prevention. And there were so many examples you gave of efforts that are de being made with other systematic ways that you're capturing the effectiveness of the different interventions. I know it's very hard, but given where you're sitting right now, some of the efforts are more expensive than others. So are there any systematic way of, of learning what actually works? Yeah, and I think that that's one of the one of the notions that the task force spoke to when they said, you know, have an after action uh, report, because I do think that's going to be critical to, to our learning here. Um, sometimes, it, you know, it, it does feel like we're in a both and all of the above kind of environment, because as, as the president says, it's a wartime effort. We just need to do as much as, as we can. I, there certainly are some efforts that don't have as much impact on their face, uh, you know, in terms of what the investment yields with outcomes. Um, but I think right now we're learning all that in real time. What we do is uh, we get a lot of insight from the states. Um, and so we'll hear, hey, this worked in this state, we'll share it. And we've created kind of a, a learning and a sharing environment for that work. And you know, the National Governors Association also created a similar environment. And then Duke Margolis uh, Center also has been convening entities, um, you know, cities, but also states to share practices. And so having those learning environments helps us tease some of that out, but we learn pretty quickly, you know, what, what works in Columbus, Ohio doesn't work in Columbus, Georgia. And, and so it's, it's just one of those things that um, I think the after action is going to be so valuable to us to, to then go back. And yes, it's going to be billions of dollars later and, and, and a lot of, a lot of hand wringing, but, um, but I think right now we're still in such a full court press that I don't think in real time we're doing all that level analysis. I do know that our colleagues at CDC do some of that um, because that, that's kind of the standard they, they're always held to. But that's part of the joy of being in the White House for me is I just get to, like the, the barbershop idea was mine. I didn't have any, like 
you know, comparative effectiveness of working with barbershops versus bodegas. But I was like, hey, listen, if I can get um, people mobilized in a space that is, you know, culturally relevant and connects folks, let's go with it. And even if that means that from 1,000 shops, 1,000 people got vaccinated, 1,000 more. We had a, you know, I'll give you another example. We did a child care initiative. And so we worked with uh, kinder care, learning care group, uh, Bright Horizons, so some of the large um, child care entities. And we got them for about four months to offer free child care to anybody going to get vaccinated, right? Which is really cool from our perspective because we wanted to remove the barriers to access. Ultimately, it was around 2,000 people dropped off their kids. I have a, I have a 10-year-old and a six-year-old. If if you tell me drop your kid off at somewhere where they've never been before so you can go get a shot, I'm probably not going to do that. But I think that for, for 2,000 people, they did. It was worthwhile and it, it, it was valuable. And so, you know, I think that it's one of those things where in an after action, you may say, oh, that, that didn't have the yield, the, as we say in government, the juice wasn't worth the squeeze, you know. But I still think that for those individuals, it was. And since it's a full court press, I think we're, we're really just throwing everything at them all that we can. So um, long-winded way of saying not so much in real time, but I do think it's going to have its, there's going to be a lot of that work on the back end. Great. Thank you. Um, up next is Lauren. Lauren, I'm um, asking for her colleague, Christine. Thank you so much for that presentation. Um, my name is Lauren Abrams and I work at Health Quality Partners of Southern California. We represent um, FQHCs down here. Um, thank you again. We were we were hoping to get some advice. Um, you talked a lot about the missing race ethnicity data, um, and then at a moment you talked a little bit about expanding data collection for the commercially insured populations, and um, of course. For at FQHCs, a large portion are uninsured, um, and they have serious concerns about reporting some of this data. We were wondering if you have any advice in terms of improving data collection. Yeah, you know, it's I think a couple of things. Data collection in different spaces, there are different challenges. So in the immunization information system space, we discovered a whole world of challenges that I don't think people have really considered as much in the past. Um, and that's altogether different from a lot of the, you know, electronic health record challenges or, or real or SOGI data or social determinants data that we're looking to collect and compile and make sure we have access to. Um, I think that, you know, you, you mentioned uh, certain populations and kind of the, the challenges of, of getting and compiling data for, the, for and from those populations. And I think that it starts with having the resources, so making sure that FQHCs have the resources for data modernization. Um, we one thing that we found from a public health standpoint is, and uh, kind of inside baseball here, we had a decrease in the race and ethnicity data completeness on cases over the last couple of months, and it wasn't because people got bored of re reporting race and ethnicity data. It's because people are leaving the public health workforce because they're exhausted from a year and a half of a pandemic. And it's because the surge has people scrambling from a public health department standpoint to do everything that they can. And that's not always reconciling race and ethnicity data for your cases. And so in their kind of hierarchy of needs, going back and, and plugging in the race and ethnicity data isn't top of the list. Um, but our solution to that is more resources for the public health workforce and making sure they've got you know, the people that they need. And that's why the president wanted to add 100,000 people to the public health workforce. And, and then also the data modernization side, like why manually does somebody have to go back and, you know, reconcile race ethnicity data for a case? How can we leverage technology to do those things? That's why, you know, partnering with, you know, I know Google has been really involved. There's a whole group of, of, um, of you know, tech organizations and, and the private sector who are saying, what can we do to help support this environment. So I think there's a lot to it. Um, one thing I will flag for you, Lauren, there's an equitable data working group that uh, that was created under an executive order by the president. It's led by uh, Dr. Alondra Nelson, who she's the one of the deputies at, um, at the Office of Science and Technology Policy. And they're considering these and other pro problems. Like they're really trying to figure out how can we update, modernize, and, and create a new data environment 
for government that's equitable. And, and they're issuing a report in the next couple of uh, weeks, so before the end of the calendar year, to the director of the Domestic Policy Council, and it's going to really drive some of the work moving forward. So I'm glad to hear the emphasis on it. Um, and I think what we do at the federal level is going to really create some opportunities at the state and local level as well, um, especially things along the lines of like data standardization um, in, in uh, you know, updating some of the standards as well. So, so yeah, hopefully, hopefully that answers your question somewhat, but I think there's a lot of ongoing work in that space. Great, thank you. Uh, Samira, you're up next. Thank you. Thank you so much for that incredible presentation. Uh, my name is Samira. I work at Community Health Center Network. We're a consortium of eight federally qualified health centers in Alameda County. And we noticed that a lot of the temporary flexibilities that you mentioned that were instituted during the public health emergency, both on a state and federal level, were really beneficial to our communities. And so I was curious how data has been collected on the outcome of those flexibilities and also how you would recommend that we best advocate um, to make some of these flexibilities more permanent. Yeah, so, so on the data collection piece, um, the different agencies uh, who are, who are you know, corresponding with some of those efforts, um, they're the ones collecting some of those data at the federal level. So um, I mentioned the eviction moratorium and some of those flexibilities. And so, uh, yes, there, there are folks that was CDC dollars that helped make that possible. So CDC's following that, I think we're, the most data that I'm seeing is actually coming from the state and local level in terms of who's collecting and compiling this information. But when you ask what you can do, I think tell those stories because I, you know what's what's so powerful to me is that um, <laughs> we talk about food insecurity and the crisis that it is in the pandemic, but it was a crisis for over twenty percent of the American population long before COVID. And so you know I'm glad that so many people are newly activated about how unfair it is for people to not have access to you know adequate food uh, or or healthy food, but that's been a problem for so many people for so long. And so the more we tell those stories and, and as you know, Ron May once said, don't let a good crisis go to waste. Listen, if this is what got you to pay attention to the affordable housing crisis, then we're gonna ride this till the wheels fall off. Tell every story you can about how these interventions helped save lives, help to keep families together, help to keep kids in school and progressing, help to you know keep folks in jobs, you know, those sorts of things that I think are are the narratives that your legislators are gonna to use to extend, uh, hopefully, uh, some of these efforts. And that's why I think our Health Equity Task Force um, made those recommendations around housing, around food access, around other you know, social drivers of health, because that work's not done and it's gonna to continue to be a challenge. But you know, one of the limitations here uh, in the executive branch is that you know, we can wanna do everything, we can wanna do anything we want, but without Congress giving us money to do it, can't do much. And so that's where your stories Connecting that with legislative advocacy can be so powerful. That's probably one of the most impactful things that you can do, especially now when all those legislators are listening. Fantastic, thank you. Christine Castano. Hi, I'm, I thank you so much for an amazing um, presentation. And I can't remember being quite so excited about something going on at the government in a long time. So this has really been inspiring. So I'm medical director for quality at what was once Healthcare Partners. We were a big, um, a big provider organization in Southern California, Los Angeles area. And we've, uh, we're now part of Optum, the big national uh, United Health Group uh, care delivery uh, network. And um, I've seen for a long time, you know, graphs about how much uh, we spend in the United States on healthcare, and yet we have such poor outcomes across other developed countries. And yet, um, when the social program spending is added to that, other countries seem to spend more on that. And it's always seemed to me to be, you know, this: if you claw away from social spending, those those impacts end up in the healthcare system ultimately, for the reasons that we're seeing as social determinants of health. And I just wonder, in terms of policy, like how much is it actually explicitly um, framed that as we increase social spending, that we should see better healthcare overall, and then less spending on trying to catch up with the problems that individuals and populations have because of the lack of social supports. Yeah, I mean, well, two things. I want to start by saying 
uh, in in every uh, in every Zoom presentation I do. Um, I, I think I'm, I'm freezing a little bit, but in every Zoom presentation I do, um, I always pick out a face on the screen who's like my reassuring smile and nod. And Christine, you have been my reassuring smile and nod all this afternoon. So thank you uh, for that. Um, no, thank you. I think I think that what's uh what's tough about it is that everything you said is right, right? The social spending is it's going to be those drivers. We know that you know health and healthcare is so between ten and twenty percent uh, of the uh, driving the impact of health outcomes based on what study you're looking at. Um, but for whatever reason, we don't have a healthcare system that acknowledges that reality and its design. And so that $3.8 trillion we spend on healthcare right now, I, I can't, I think it's hard to, to make the case sometimes that spending in other spaces is gonna reduce proportionally that $3.8 trillion, right? Because we, we do have a sick care system. It is designed around treating illness as opposed to keeping people healthy. So the realignment of incentives is gonna be the key to being able to, I mean, it's, if you think about value-based payment, it's been the thing that got people to start paying attention to Z codes. I know you, you said, you you know, if, if you realize all of a sudden, oh, my patients being, you know, having a home, having food, having, you know, these, these basic needs met, that's what enables me to not have them readmitted to the hospital within 30 days. That's what, allowed, you know, so I think that as we continue that revolution of value-based payment, um, programs, I think it's going to move us a little bit closer, a little, a little away from that sick care system, a little bit away from that fee-for-service kind of perverse incentives design that drives us to $3.8 trillion. And then I think there are incredibly, incredible inefficiencies in our healthcare system um, that also drive up the cost. And, um, and so I think when you put that together, I think the data environment becomes really important, uh, data sharing, and that was something the ACA aimed to do. Um, I think that deferred care plays a big role. And, and so people having access to care is huge. And, and we're seeing more and more of that, um, you know, especially again, post ACA, and especially now that we've had um, you know, increased enrollment of late. So, so all of these things are related. I think, you know, ultimately health is a really compelling moral endpoint. It, it works for people. You can say you're preventing deaths, you're preventing folks getting sick, you're extending you know, productive years uh, of employees. And, and I think those are really valuable things to, to say and to talk about. And so I, I think it, it is becoming increasingly part of the discourse. I don't think the ROI conversation is, is necessarily there yet, but I think that the more we align our healthcare system to, to take that in and to invest upstream, um, I'm, I'm channeling uh, Dr. Rishi Manchanda, Californian, uh, right now, kind of upstreamist doctoring, right? I think that's really important for us to do in, in terms of uh, really making, making headway and building those bridges, decreasing healthcare costs. Uh, but, uh, you know, one thing I'll say, this is not me speaking on behalf of the president, but I don't know that America cares whether we spend $3.6 trillion or $3.8 trillion or $4 trillion. Um, I think that, you know, there's a, a a long-standing question of maybe this is just how much money a nation of our size and that our level of development spends on healthcare. And is that necessarily a bad thing? But the premise of your question really hit the nail on the head. It's not a bad thing if our outcomes are good, right? And for some people in this country, they, there are outcomes and there's access to care that outstrips what you can get anywhere else in the world. And for other people in this country, is not. So it's the inequity in our healthcare system that really creates those inefficiencies in the spending. And so you really have to center around inequity to, to kind of crack the nut on, on having an effective healthcare system, no matter how much we're spending. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. All right, Serene, you're up next. Hi, my name is Serene Pagosian. I am the health equity manager at uh, the Community Clinic Association of Los Angeles County. We're a consortium of uh, community health centers um, of 64 across the Los Angeles County area. Um, and I I'm really glad that you, you talked on um, both things that I wanted to touch on today, uh, access, and, and you just mentioned ROI as well. Um, so when we think of access, right, we think of how access should not be dependent on um, 
uh, on necessarily health outcomes, but more on health equity. Um, and when we, we've kind of had this um, discussion within our health centers and some of our CMOs of how we may be risking um, or taking away access when we focus too much on health outcomes that we do not see right away. And when we think of ROI and we think of the big picture of how, how we get bigger players involved in the health equity world and how we get more investments, um, ROI often comes up. And I'm wondering if you have any advice as to how we can better frame that ROI approach to not necessarily focus too heavily on the health outcome piece um, to where we do not risk taking away access if we don't see health out the uh, proper health outcomes right away. Yeah. And that, that's such a philosophical question in terms of what our healthcare system is and what it isn't. And, you know, in 2002, uh, the then Institutes of Medicine um, issued a report called Cross Inequality Chasm and it talked about the six aims of a high functioning healthcare system and is safety, timeliness, effectiveness, efficiency, patient centeredness, and equity. And in the last 20 years, you've seen dramatic efforts to improve safety. Uh, you know, there's the report to air is human. And, and I think that was a big deal in kind of moving the needle on, on safety. Uh, timeliness of care. You know, you have so many metrics in hospitals and healthcare systems around timeliness. Effectiveness and efficiency, of course, those are critical goals. Patient-centeredness, if you're in a healthcare system, uh, you know about press gaming. You know, you know about, you know, these, these you know, the, the way that, customers are being served in healthcare settings. But for whatever reason, equity was always the one that was left out because it didn't align as well with the economic reality of healthcare. And I spoke to this a little bit earlier, but I think that that's where I got the most excited about the value-based payment changes, right? Because I think that it finally creates a financial reason for people to invest in equity. My, my, my realization is that, um, any entity that's driven by maximizing uh, revenue isn't going to do this out of the goodness of their heart. And so when you align their incentives uh, toward equity, that's the reason why so many systems have pushed back against uh, more value-based contracts, because they're just like, I don't know how much it's going to cost me to take care of this person. And that's risk that I don't know that I'm ready to take. Yeah, and to some extent, I say, at some point, we have to take that decision out of your hands and just say, keep people healthy and do it, you know, as efficiently as possible. And that's what gets you paid. <laughs> and I think that it, it'll help us because then we're not trying to convince people that they're doing a social good by investing in and engaging in health equity. If they're driven by maximizing their revenue, let's make it so that they have to, the only way to maximize their revenue is by having an equitable healthcare system. Uh, I, I think that's, maybe that's me being cynical, but I, I think that that's, that's, I think, what the next evolution in this work is. And we've got, I think, that's what I love seeing out of the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation, CMMI. They do, they do really great work um, kind of pushing that agenda. Thank you. Fantastic. Great. Sunita, you're up. Great. I have a question for you that's about kind of the, the different levers that we can use. So typically, pre-pandemic, when we think about vaccinations, we think about primary care, whether it's pediatricians or internal medicine or family medicine is playing a really important role in that delivery and in that access to populations. We haven't seen that in this pandemic in the same way. So I wonder what, what advice would you give when you think about what primary care needs to do differently or how we need to think differently about the role of primary care in these kinds of health equity efforts? Because I think we believe we are squarely in the middle of it, I'll say, as a primary care physician, but clearly it's played out differently. And so what advice do you have? Well, I mean, there are a couple of things that have been really clear in this pandemic. It's that um, the primary care workforce shortages that we have are significant and they, they are all the more um, you know, challenging or they challenge us all the more when we have a crisis like this. Uh, and so I think that in that way, um, I think really bolstering what our primary care infrastructure looks like is gonna be critical. I think that um, in 
there, there's a whole dialogue around kind of modernization of primary care and what that looks like um, from a from a um, resources standpoint, from a data sharing standpoint, um, from a who the providers are standpoint. And I think that those are all, you know, going to be parts of the conversation. But, I, you know, it's, it's a tough question because I actually, um, in this pandemic, before coming to the White House, I was on this primary care uh, task force here in Virginia and just looking at the impact of the pandemic on primary care, right? Not how to optimize primary care, but I mean, these practices still aren't whole. There's, they still don't have the staff that they that they lost at the beginning of, pan, of the pandemic. They still are seeing, uh, you know, a percentage less in terms of revenue coming in every day. It's made it hard for them to be sustainable. So, I mean, I think it's just the, I think the first question is just, how do we continue to invest in and make these practices whole because they're the backbone of our healthcare system? Um, and then I think from there, it's how do we make sure they're in a position to, to really help advance our real goal, which is the health and well-being of our communities. But um, I don't know, I don't know that I have a good answer uh, to your question, other than um, there, I think there's a huge amount of investment in primary care that we're gonna have to make. And staying with my theme of realigning incentives. I think that's going to be a big part of how we support primary care, <laughs> you know, is, is how do we, you know, we talk so much and I'm getting on a soapbox here because of COVID vaccines, but we talk so much about counseling people about being vaccinated, but we weren't paying providers to do all this counseling. And, and I think that when you have that dynamic, how can you both expect, you know, somebody out of the goodness of their heart to spend the 20 minutes it'll take to counsel somebody through all the mythology around COVID vaccines, but not pay them for it. You know, and we're seeing that with pregnant people right now because we're talking to OB, OBs and we're saying, hey, can you, every appointment, can you do this counseling? And they're like, yeah, you pay me to do it. You know, and so those are the sorts of things that I think we have, we have to put a premium on on that, on the time spent counseling. And I think that's, that's uh, you know, going to be big advocacy work for the private care space for years to come. Thank you. Laura Miller. Yeah, it's great. Thank you so much. This, as I echo Christine saying, I haven't been so excited to see things with a White House banner behind them in a long time. And I just really appreciated your verve. And I wanted to ask a question and forgive me if I sound too much like an old mom, but I'm so proud of you. How did you get to where you are? I'm really interested in your formation, your training, you know, your vocabulary of activism, as well as your deep soaking in policy and the clinical. It's like, how did you do that? Yeah, I, well, I was raised in the social justice space, right? Like one my first mentors were in social justice spaces. And so, you know, when I, when I made the decision, I wanted to be a doctor since I was five years old, and I always tell that story because, you know, uh, they say you can't be what you don't see. And my primary care doctor when I was five was a young black man. And so for me, seeing a black man in a white coat in our community was was transformative. And that's what set that goal. But also um, seeing that, you know, my uncle's cousin's family community were suffering worse health outcomes told me there was this social justice dynamic at play. And I felt like, well, maybe that's where I want to be. And, and when you're 18 years old wanting to do social justice work, you can't help but become a bit of an activist. And then plugging that into the kind of medical establishment, um, you know, I always felt like I was a bit of a, you know, square peg trying to get into a, a round hole until, you know, I found, found my people. I think that, you know, the Jack Geigers of the world, I was just like, that's awesome. We need more of that, right? Like, uh, I think those are, those are there's Quentin Young in Chicago when I was doing law school in Chicago and learning from people like that who were really physicians who were at the vanguard of, of doing some really creative uh, social justice work. And, um, and, and that's just what I decided the kind of doctor that I wanted to be. People ask like, what's your identity? And I do policy work, I, I do uh, a lot of you know, advocacy work, but ultimately I say I'm a doctor doing those things, you know, and you have to be grounded in, in something. Um, but I mean, the best answer to your question is I've got really awesome parents and, uh, and, and they, they, you know, there are six kids in my family. They supported our, our goals and, and they you know, surrounded us with, with uh, the right folks. And then along the way, this is the advice I give a lot of people that I mentor is that I built a kind of life board of directors when I was about 19. And so all the people I admired, I, you know, I tell folks, you know, this is, 
This is the information age. You can Google almost anybody's email address. And if you're tenacious enough, you can build relationships with folks. And that's what I, that's what I did. And it's funny because now, you know, 20 years later, I think a lot of these people are just like, yeah, you've been my mentee for a long time. And I was like, yeah, you didn't respond to my first 12 emails. You don't remember that, but I do, you know? And, and, and I think that, um, you know, it's, it's cool because I have people who have been with me at every step on this journey. Um, and it, it's helpful. And I've made intentional decisions. Like I did a primary care track for my residency in internal medicine because I was just like, I want to spend more of my time in primary care spaces. And even though I'm a hospitalist now, it gave me the opportunity to do a lot more and learn a lot more about that space. And so just being intentional on the way. But, uh, but thanks for asking. That was fantastic. Well, I'm going to uh, ask the final question. Um, thank you again for your time. This has been such a phenomenal talk. Uh, you know, as you know, all of us in this on this call, we all work in healthcare in some capacity. Some are clinicians, some are senior leadership, some are QI managers. We work in IPAs, fairly qualified health centers, consortias. What's your call to action for us? We, you know, as we are take moving forward, really committed to advancing health equity. Mm -hmm. What's my, your call to action for us? Yeah, I, I, I love the question because I said it earlier. Um, you know, you don't, you can't let a, a good crisis go to waste. And and I think that in this moment, um, this is the moment to step on the gas, to to call in every favor, to talk to every legislator, to to build more coalitions, to, to do the collective impact strategies, to really think about all the things that you can do in unison to move things forward because our, our nation experienced a collective trauma. Our nation is collectively reeling um, from the effects of this pandemic. And you know, the president describes it as his build back better agenda. And I'm a sucker for alliteration, but I think even beyond that, you know, the notion behind it gives me a lot of hope. Like this idea that we're not trying to get back to where we were. We're trying to create something new that's better. And, um, and the, the scorekeepers of what's better is you. <laughs> and so I think your ability to say, this is that better we want to build back to, this is the time to, to kind of plant your flag and say, this is exactly what we're doing. So, I would say you know, certainly mobilize, definitely, you know, lean into your advocacy. I think that, um, you know, making sure you're advocating for the resources you need, show the evidence of the impact of things that, that you've been able to do through the pandemic and why we need to continue to invest or focus in different places. Um, I think that this is, this is a moment where coming out of the pandemic, we're going to say, what did we learn? And you get to shape that narrative. So that the call to action is, you know, you, you have a window. Um, it's not going to last forever. Um, the the twenty four hour news cycle that is America means that there's going to be another problem in a couple months from now, and so you really do have to mobilize right now <laughs> and, and keep mobilizing because I know you have been. Um, so that's that's my call to action. And I, and then uh, the last thing I'll say, just to wrap it up. Um, it was suggested that I was born with a superpower and I didn't want to end the session without explaining, but, um, but I was, uh, I was born with six fingers on my left hand. Um, and some of you are probably thinking of the princess bride. It wasn't like that. It was a little, you know, pedunculate, a little stock and then a, a little finger, pretty terrifying. My mom didn't notice it at first. And then, uh, the doctor was like, we'll, we'll take care of that, that digit. And then she screamed. And my dad thought it was funny because my dad also had a sixth finger and he didn't tell her. Um, and so it was a surprise. But as, as I got older, I was just like, what, what was that thing, right? I don't have like a phantom limb, but I do, I do feel like, oh, that was kind of a weird factoid. And as I got into med school, started doing some research, apparently it's a genetic mutation on the, the P arm of chromosome 13. And, you know, being a fan of X-Men, I was like, so I'm a mutant. <laughs> and, and it's unclear at what point my other mutant superpowers are going to manifest. Um, but I just tell people, don't make me angry because that might be the thing that brings out the mutant superpower. So, so just uh, you know, tread, tread carefully.
but I, I can't tell you all how much I've appreciated and enjoyed this time with you this uh, this afternoon. It's been a lot of fun, and I'm just inspired by by your spirit, by your engagement, by your enthusiasm, and by the work that you do. And we say all the time, California is the, the leading the leading edge in so many ways. Uh, <laughs> and, 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 um, and I'm grateful for you. So thanks for having me. Oh, well, thank you so much, everyone. Please help me in thanking Dr. Webb. This was fantastic. I really wanted to ask, but I didn't. Um, so thanks for that little shout out at the 